Hi everyone. Uh, good evening. Good morning. Good afternoon. Wherever you are, uh, today we have uh, one of the amazing speakers, Shaira, uh, whom I met in Tel Aviv, and I am really, really uh, in awe the way um, she articulates things. And she's one of the amazing speakers I've ever met. So today we have uh, her on the show, and she's going to be speaking about cloud security. So um, I would give it to her so that she can introduce herself. Uh, hi everyone and hi Vandana. It's a great pleasure and honor uh, to be here with the InfoSec uh, girls and in your uh, webinar. And today we're going to talk about cloud security and where it meets us with our applications. Uh, I've been doing cloud security with, with Dome 9 that was acquired last year by Checkpoint. And ever since then we've been doing a lot of uh, development of cloud security products uh, inside of Checkpoint, including uh, the product I've been working on called Logic that does intrusion detection in the cloud. And today I'll be talking with you a little bit about uh, mistakes, common mistakes that people do in the cloud and what should we be, do, be doing um, in order for these mistakes not to happen to us and to take uh, cloud security in the, in the right way to make our applications work and be stable and safe. So, uh, without uh, further ado, let's, let's get started. Um, if you guys remember, this is like kind of a general graph of, of old on-prem um, infrastructure. And back in the days when on-prem is all we had, uh, doing security was fairly easy uh, because all you had to do was put a firewall in, in your exit nodes and that way you can control and filter everything that's going in and out of your environment and that was really easy and you felt really really safe and happy about it uh, but today things uh, don't work like that anymore in the on-prem days uh, you know all of our security products had the word uh, prevention in them uh, because you could easily prevent bad stuff from happening and it's not like that anymore today in the age of cloud every dev team has their own uh, cloud account and they can actually do whatever they want they don't need uh, the IT manager anymore to um, you know to spin up a new a new asset for them a new server for them they can with a click of a button they can have dozens of servers spinned up uh, whenever they want and one of the challenges it gives uh, security managers is that they can't, um, you know, enforce their policies sometimes. You can have someone spinning up a database that uh, contains sensitive data that is not encrypted, that is not password protected, no MFA, because no one made that developer um, enforce these kind of policies. And the, the developers mainly care about deploying uh, their net next feature and not being more secured because security is a hustle. Um, and this is, a, this is a bunch of, of companies that you know, I gathered uh, in the last couple of years. And the common ground for all of them is that in the last couple of years, all of them had data breaches. And you know, I could have put a lot more uh, logos in this uh, slide, but at the end of the day, uh, these are, you know, really big brands that all of us are using all the time. And it means that these kind of mistakes, if they happen to the biggest ones, what does it mean about us? These companies have massive uh, security bu budget and they can actually afford the best security engineers and the best security tools and it still happened to them. What does it mean about you know, smaller companies, smaller organizations, organizations that only recently moved to the cloud? Um, we also didn't mention here companies that were hacked, not for the purpose of their data. This is a whole different topic that we can talk about it uh, on a different time, but you know, hacks are not only for data, they can be for other purposes as well. And generally I split the world uh, between companies that have been hacked and companies that don't know that they've been hacked. And this is why we can add a lot more logos into this uh, slide. Um, so prevention doesn't work anymore. Um, as I said, today we have to take security uh, and do it, do it differently. And now it shifted from the IT people more to the development 
the developer team, uh, they, they have to do some of the security themselves. Uh, and let's talk about a few examples. Today, um, you know, the average enterprise has between 70 and 80 different security solutions. So you have to juggle between all of them. And at the end of the day, we don't feel more secure. We buy more products, but we don't feel better about it at all. So it's kind of a paradox. Uh, and the, the bigger paradox is that there are a lot of very basic things all of us can do. It's not a new product. It doesn't cost us more, but we can do it to improve our security posture and feel more secure. Um, you know, cloud, uh, some people would say cloud uh, is a new perimeter a new perimeter we need to protect. It also has a lot of uh, new buzzwords that all of you are familiar with, like serverless and Kubernetes and containers. Um, but I actually say that the cloud eliminated the perimeter for us. For me as a security researcher, I cannot look at the cloud as, as one attack surface. The cloud is is built from so many different surfaces uh, that we can, there is no perimeter anymore at all. We can, there isn't a, even two or three vectors that we can surround and protect. There is no perimeter, so we have to do our best in many different areas. And because we have to get to know a lot of different areas, uh, we are prone to, do, to make those mistakes because we cannot, uh, the blanket is too short sometimes. We try to, to you know, stretch it and extend it, uh, but we cannot cover all the possible attack vectors. And just a reminder before we, we dive into some examples, uh, the shared responsibility model. Uh, if in the past, uh, in the on-prem days, our, our, our IT people were responsible for everything from the bare metal to the operating system uh, that we, we run on this machine and to the data that we uh, keep on that machine. Today, uh, more and more of the responsibility shifted to the developers and AWS are, as an example, or Azure or GCP are the ones who are responsible to the bare metal. Uh, and the, and you know, all we have to do is like choose the type of machine that we want the operating system that we want on it, click, and, and it is spinned up for us. Uh, but now everything that has to do with security is our, our fault or is our responsibility. Uh, and this is the shared responsibility model. Now it's us and the cloud vendor together. Um, from a survey that was conducted by Checkpoint and Cybersecurity Insiders, we got to see some of the security threats that uh, are the way they are seen by security professionals. And we can see over here that almost half of the professionals are concerned about unauthorized access, insecure uh, interface and APIs, and misconfiguration. But all of these three examples are actually misconfigurations by themselves. If you have an unauthorized access, it means that you misconfigured your IAM, your identity and access uh, management or your active directory. Uh, if, if someone can abuse uh, your API, it means that you misconfigured your roles and permissions. Um, so these are all examples to mistakes and misconfigurations that our IT and DevOps are doing in the cloud. Um, according to Gartner by 2020, which is in a month from now, 95% uh, of security incidents in the cloud are going to be uh, our fault, are going to be a misconfiguration. And by uh, 2023, it's going to be 99%. That means that basically every uh, security incident in the cloud starts and ends with a misconfiguration with a mistake that someone made and we don't like to make mistakes especially not mistakes that are going to be uh, very costly for us and let's start by giving some examples for example uh, we will start with identity and access management so this is the way for us uh, to give permissions to users to another machine to access another machine 
uh, to give uh, third parties permission to do stuff uh, in our cloud account, sometimes we give permissions to a service that um, uh, tries to make better performance or to choose better assets or to give us another layer of protection. But it also means that we give them uh, permissions. And, and very often we make mistakes uh, when we grant permissions. Uh, and let's, let's take a look at a couple of examples. Uh, the most basic one is actually leaving API keys uh, in code repositories, for example, in GitHub. Um, all of you had heard about uh, what happened to, to Uber who left credentials in GitHub. And you would expect that after it happened once and twice and three times, people will stop uh, uh, leaving their credentials in GitHub, but no, uh, it keeps on happening. Sometimes there are good reasons to leave credentials in your code repository, but uh, there are no good reasons to leave their credentials that have access to a lot of your assets, that it's unnecessary for uh, whoever runs that code to get access to. If it requires to give access to a specific uh, S3 bucket, give access only to that bucket. Don't uh, put the star that gives access to all the S3s. And this is exactly what we see users do. They leave credentials uh, to their entire uh, account or they leave a token that, you know, lets people uh, log into their AWS account and make changes. Now, specifically, we're talking about GitHub. Um, since it's a code repository, so after I tell users, listen, you have to, you have to change that, they go ahead and uh, delete the key uh, from the code but since it's a repository, we still have access to the key in your older versions. So it's not enough. You also have to rotate the key and make sure uh, it only gives access to the necessary resources. Another example that we saw uh, was tokens in, inside of apps. So again, we see developers make these uh, mistakes all the time. We consider them as mistakes. They consider it as a quick way uh, to save some, some headache and some hassle from themselves. But this is very, very, very bad practices. And it exposes users' data uh, to uh, malicious um, actors. Let's talk a little bit about storage services. We keep on hearing a lot about uh, the S3 bucket and how vulnerable they are. Uh, the problem is not S3, obviously the problem is us. AWS understood that and, and the bucket by default does not have access to the internet. Even though uh, if you go to Shodan right now and look for S3 buckets, you're going to see a lot of them open to the internet. Uh, and that's because users open, users open them and forgot to close them or forgot to restrict um, the access to the S3, and this is very, very important. Um, so we see these kind of examples uh, all the time of users uh, leaving their buckets open, and by that, uh, causing a lot of problems to themselves. Um, again, it happens to, to everyone, and it's very, very unfortunate. The problem is not only uh, with S3 buckets, uh, this is a screenshot from my Azure account, and I opened the blob. The blob is the equivalent to S3 in Azure. And as you can see, by default over here, uh, the, the bucket is open, the blob is open uh, to the internet. So it means that I, after I, I spin up the blob, I have to specifically look for this configuration page, page and change it and, and close the blob uh, from, access, from access through the, the public internet. Another interest, interesting thing I saw uh, in the blob is that uh, it has um, a URL that uh, I can get access to. It's the same as in S3 because in S3, you know, each, each name for a bucket is, is unique. Uh, this is because the, the bucket also gets a URL that is unique. Um, specifically in the blob, uh, since you can see over here, this is the blob that I opened uh, for practice. Um, and you would say, okay, but the, your name is so unique, no one's going to guess it. And you're right. I, also, I don't have anything interesting in that blob. 
Um, but, um, oh, whoops. Yeah, this is what I wanted to show you. Uh, there was a research uh, by, um, by a researcher named um, Jan Masaryk. You can find it on GitHub. And we will also add a link to his GitHub uh, at the end of the podcast, of the webinar. And he made a research about names of blobs on the internet and found out that there is a re reuse of a lot of words in the bucket. And that means that you think you're super original when you call your bucket uh, something with images or something with backup or something with uploads, but you're not original at all. A lot of users are using these uh, words in their bucket names. And this is why looking up for, uh, you know, random combinations uh, between these words actually brings back results and it puts uh, your blobs in, in risk. So um, it's not enough to give them a very unique and cool name because uh, there are a lot of scrolling tools, crawling tools uh, that, are, that are out there on GitHub. Everyone can look them up and, and uh, crawl on different uh, blobs and find the ones that are open to the internet and try to extract data from them. Um, let's talk a little bit about compute power and abusing your, your cloud account for, for other stuff. So we can see attacks like denial of wallet, which actually, which actually means that someone is using your account for other purposes and you're paying for it. Uh, you can do it uh, for different purposes, for example, for crypto mining. So that means that a hacker is running a machine uh, that mines uh, Bitcoin and you're paying the bill. So they get the coins uh, and you're paying the bill or using your cloud assets to create, for example, a DDoS attack. So again, you're paying the bill. You're actually involved in, in some possibly criminal activity and you're not even aware of that and you're paying for it. Um, a few nice examples. In this example, uh, we had Tesla, which again is a very big and known company uh, who started using containers. And in one of their uh, login pages, uh, they didn't put a password. So a hacker was able to log in uh, and get access uh, to, uh, to a container that had credentials to the rest of the cloud account. So by that, they gained access uh, to a Tesla uh, AWS account and started uh, crypto mining at the expense of Elon Musk. Um, another nice example um, is, is code that we get you know, in packages uh, that uh, we inherit, that we use, and we assume that it's okay because a lot of other people used it before us, but it's not okay. Um, you always have to check it and check your dependencies because in this example, we had a code that was looking for wallets and stealing uh, the Bitcoin uh, inside of them. So someone was using code for totally different purposes, but the, his users uh, had their uh, Bitcoin stolen from them unknowingly. Uh, we also saw um, a malware family a specific malware that uh, is using uh, AWS to hijack computers. Uh, so again, we see, we see this kind of abuse of compute power. So after, after giving these few examples um, and showing you that protecting the cloud is not easy, it's no longer at the network level at all. Protecting the cloud is totally different now. It's coming from the API uh, point of view, from the user point of view, from the packages point, from the code that we run. So we understand it's very complicated. Now, a couple of months ago, uh, we heard uh, about a hack that happened to Capital One. Uh, this was a cloud native hack. Uh, up until now, every hack that I heard of that involved the cloud started with a more traditional attack vector like phishing or you know someone leaving their credentials online but it's not unique to the 
cloud. But in this case, uh, we saw an attack vector that actually exploited a cloud infrastructure in, in an elegant way, so to speak. And let me share with you a little bit about how it happened. So first of all, the damage, or at the bottom line, what we saw over there. Um, the hacker stole and uh, exposed to the internet uh, PII uh, data, personal data of more than 100 million people. That means that their social security numbers, uh, their names, their emails, their password, their addresses, and so on. Uh, all of these were exposed to the internet. This is a lot of data, and this is going to cost a lot of money. In addition to that, it wasn't only Capital One that were um, exposed to this hack and were hurt by it. There were other about 30 or so victims, including universities, including Ford, uh, including um, an Italian telecom company. Uh, so there were a lot of other victims too. And the hacker did not settle for, for getting the, the data. Uh, but also installed crypto miners so that, you know, we could earn a little more uh, money on the side until uh, it got discovered. So let's go over uh, the steps of the attack as we understand it. Uh, we're not completely sure about everything that happened, but we have a good guess. Um, it, start, it started probably with a scanner that was looking for a vulnerable web application. Uh, Capital One had uh, an SSRF vulnerability in their web application. SSRF stands for server-side request forgery. That means um, that an attacker can make a backend server make requests on his behalf. And because the backend server is uh, executing these requests, they look legitimate. But in fact, uh, the origin of these requests is not the backend server, but the attacker themselves. Um, and this is how uh, the hacker in this case was able to make really weird requests that if it wasn't for this vulnerability, uh, it wasn't possible to, to execute. Um, the, the requests were made to the metadata service. Um, in AWS, every asset has a metadata service where uh, different things are being registered and stored. Um, one of the things that is stored over there is tokens. Uh, now, usually you, you get access to the metadata service through an internal IP address. It's not, you, you can't, uh, you know, serve the internet and get access to random metadata services of different assets. You have to uh, be logged into your AWS account and get access from an internal IP address of that uh, VPC. Um, and in this case, uh, we created a simulation of this hack. So it's really small, but you can see uh, over here the IP address of the metadata service. It means that if you log into your AWS console right now uh, and try to access this IP address from one of your machines, you're going to get to the metadata service of this specific machine. It's, as you can see, it's a local IP address. Uh, so this is us making a request to the metadata service of a specific asset that we spinned up uh, for this for this specific case. And you can see all the things we can ask from the metadata service. Um, for example, uh, identity credentials or IAM, a host name, and so on. So you can ask for many different things. And in this case, we ask for security credentials. And we can see that there is one credential over here that is named bedroll wide S3 access. So you can make a guess about what this role actually does. This role has access to S3 buckets. And then um, the hacker actually asked to get tokens. And here we are. Uh, we asked to get the bedroll wide S3 access and we got it. Here's a token and here is a token in, in the plain text 
version of it. And you can actually copy paste it and use it and log into the AWS account. It's as simple as that. So the hacker got a token and I ran a list uh, and sync commands. That means that she asked to see all the S3 buckets available uh, in the account. And I'm sure she was very surprised to see that she had access to all of them. And then she did the sync command that actually downloaded um, the content of these buckets to her computer. And this is how she got access to all of that data. And as I mentioned before, uh, we understand that she also installed um, crypto miners. So this is how we understand how this attack happened. But as you can probably guess, I think that this attack was also uh, could have been prevented. Um, first of all, the SSR vulnerability uh, and you know uh, web vulnerabilities in general, uh, you always have to check your application. Uh, and make sure it's not vulnerable to such trivial um, attack vectors. And I'm sure all of you are already doing that. And if not, uh, you, you're more than welcome to check out uh, OWASP top 10 and make sure that your application is as safe as possible. Uh, but we also saw, you know, unusual behavior here, for example, um, making a list and sync of all the S3 buckets. Uh, or getting a token uh, in this very unusual way through the metadata service. This is not something um, that you usually do in your account. And if you track your activities and look for anomalies, this would be one of the anomalies that's going to pop out. Uh, making this kind of use through the metadata service and making use of this token from an external IP address these are all very unusual behaviors uh, that, that could have, you know, we could have detected this hack uh, much earlier and not only by, uh, by the bug bounty, because this hack was detected thanks to a bug bounty program that Capital One had and not through any other uh, super sophisticated um, security product. So, we talked about prevention. Uh, you need to know your roles. This means that if there is a role with a very wide permissions, you might want to, and most of these permissions are not being used, you might want to consider removing some of them off. You have to remove some of them off. I know it's really, it's a hustle, but it's gonna, it's gonna save your ass possibly. So you need to know your roles who, who you're granting them with and what kind of things they can execute. The least privilege principle, it's a very, very basic principle that unfortunately not everyone follows. Don't give people access and machine access to places they don't need. If you have a web server that needs access to an S3 bucket because there is some code or pictures that you want to upload uh, to your website, that's great. It means that you only need a role to that specific S3 bucket, not to all the buckets in your account. And this is just one small example, but giving access and giving privileges this way uh, makes your account very, very vulnerable to these kind of mistakes. Um, monitor who is running commands and where they are running them from. Um, if, if all of a sudden a command is being executed from a public IP address where usually uh, you do it from within the VPC or if you usually do it from your New York office and all of a sudden someone is generating keys from uh, Paris. So this is unusual and you should definitely check if one of your DevOps engineers is traveling or if their credentials were stolen. Uh, so make sure you know who's running the commands and where are they running them from. And in this example, uh, we, talk a to we took a token, uh, the one that uh, we used before in the bedroll with wide um, S3 access. And you can see here, uh, we tried to simulate exactly what happened um, in, the, uh, in the Capital One hack. And in this case, you see an instance uh, it's, an, it's an instance ID, and before it, you can see this uh, string. That means that someone is 
getting access through this instance. It's not the instance that is getting access uh, using this role. This is an, an assume role activity. So someone is assuming the role and using this instance. Uh, and because it's in the logs, it means that it can be detected. If it's in the logs, we can detect this kind of activity and create a rule based on it. You don't need a super sophisticated uh, machine learning and AI to detect these kind of things. You need to know how your environment behaves usually and to create rules to detect unusual behaviors. Um, and another really cool thing that we can notice is the use of Kali. Uh, if your engineers usually don't use Kali Linux, you can, as you can see, it appears in the user agent and, and you can detect that. Uh, it actually happens, you can react immediately and not to wait for maybe days or weeks uh, until your data was already exfiltrated um, uh, for your account. Um, and this is it from me to you uh, about uh, cloud security and how we can improve the security of our applications. Uh, if you're interested uh, to know a little more about how we do um, security analytics and detection in the cloud, you can check out uh, the Checkpoint uh, blog that appears here on the screen or go look me up uh, on LinkedIn or Twitter and I'll be happy to uh, answer any questions you might have. Thank you so much, Ira. It's amazing. Uh, it's great information. I'm sure a lot of people are going to come back to you asking questions <laughs> because this is the need of the R. Perfect. And thank you so much for having me.